Tonight on Children's Hospital. Bone marrow transplant. A bone marrow transplant could save six-year-old Emily's life. And come into hospital to get better. Baby Blake's got an angry red rash. Oh, you got it on your foot? Foot. And a nasty cut on the head for two-year-old Joseph. <laughs> In the heart of the city lies the new Royal Manchester Children's Hospital, one of the biggest and most up-to-date hospitals for children in the country. Its state-of-the-art equipment provides patients with some of the best healthcare facilities in the world, while its medical team of a thousand work tirelessly to change the lives of children when they need it most. Oh, don't do that. Meet six-year-old Emily Fish. There's my house. I like playing and I like singing. Emily's just an amazing little girl. She's full of energy, full of life. <laughs> she just enjoys things that other six-year-olds like. He's my fun and plays in his world someday. But although she looks well, Emily's life is in danger. Just six months ago, she was diagnosed with severe aplastic anemia, a life-threatening blood disorder that affects around one in a million children. Emily's parents first realised there was something wrong when she started bruising too easily and looking increasingly pale. When there's not much blood in me, it makes me feel tired, not got much energy, no, and it makes me feel all floppy. Doctors aren't fully aware of what causes this rare blood disorder, but it developed very quickly in Emily, leaving her dangerously vulnerable to infection. Just in a matter of two or three days, you, you've gone from having a little daughter who's, who's running around everywhere and you think it's perfectly fine, to having a child who's seriously ill, really seriously ill, and not knowing what you're facing. You just think it's, it's never going to happen to you, and we're just in a state of shock, really. Mm. Emily's being treated at the Children's Hospital by Dr Rob Wynne, who heads up one of the largest paediatric bone marrow transplant units in the country. He's been giving transplants to children for over 12 years and is involved in cutting-edge stem cell research. In severe aplastic anemia, the bone marrow has failed. Now, the bone marrow is like the factory for blood, and, um, and so it's like there's no one in the factory and so there's no blood being made. Over the coming years, her risk of dying is high, probably from infection. Emily's body is severely low in red blood cells, which carry oxygen around the body, and white blood cells, which help fight infection. Her only real chance of survival is a bone marrow transplant, which will provide her with new cells and a healthy immune system. Sad and angry, scared or worried. Best describes how you're feeling. Um, I feel... I feel frightened. I have... But the risks are high and the transplant itself could prove fatal. Today, Dr Wynne has the tough job of talking to Emily's mum and dad about giving their final consent for the transplant. These are difficult conversations, family, because we talk about risk, including risk of dying. Transplant clearly on the evidence gives her the best chance of being free of this disease and well in five years' time. Our judgment is that it's the right thing to do, but consent means that we're asking you to share that judgment with us. Mm -hmm. You need to be able to look back on the decision that you're taking today in a year's time, in five years' time, and say, we did what we thought was right for our daughter. Um, it's really hard. It's just because she just seems so well, but we know she is, you know, poorly. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I'm happy yeah, to I'll sign it. It's not the sort of thing you, you want to be facing, but you, you, we are. And you know, we just want our daughter better, really, at the end of the day, and that's what we want. What families go through, um, it's impossible to put yourself in their, in their shoes, but we are quite certain that this is the right thing to do and the right process. And for Emily, the decision is simple. I'm going to have a bone marrow transplant. It's going to make me better. <laughs> and I like getting better.
The hospital's A&E department's open 24-7 and sees over 100 children a day. Two-year-old Blake's just arrived with an angry red rash all over his body. What's this on your tummy? Is it sore? Um, Grandma. Are you going on your foot? Foot. Itchy head and itchy back? Yeah. 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 Uh, oh, no. Mum Sandra works as a nursing assistant in another Manchester hospital. She came home to discover Blake had suddenly changed colour. Just all of a sudden, he went a bit um, like limp and like he'd fainted. Went very red and then had like a cold sweat and then all of a sudden these have started to come up. It just looks a bit, it looks bad. <laughs> Consultant Rachel Jenner has seen plenty of allergic reactions like Blake's in her 10 years of emergency medicine. It's coming up on his, like his face yeah. and behind his ears now and it's starting to spot down his legs. Okay, and he's his nappy. Yeah. Yeah. He's never had anything like this before. Never. It looks fairly classical that you get these raised red lumps and it's caused by the release of a chemical called histamine under the skin, which is why we give antihistamine medications to, to try and calm it down. Yeah. So if it's a very widespread reaction like this and it's the first time it's happened, it can affect the breathing and it can affect the circulation. In those circumstances, seeking urgent medical attention is very, very important. Blake's breathing fine, so all he needs are antihistamine tablets and some steroids to calm the rash down. And he's perked up in his cell, not itching as much as he was, so he seems a bit more calmer. Some of the most common triggers for allergic reactions are dust mites, nuts and pollen, but it's still not clear what caused Blake's rash. Often it's just a one-off. Um, we see it and then it goes away and it never comes back and it remains a mystery. On the second floor, six-year-old Emily Fish has arrived for a bone marrow transplant that could save her life. Bone marrow, transplant, unit. The unit is one of the biggest in the country and Emily is very impressed with the facilities. If it's only on the remote control, it must be it can do tallies and DVDs. Yeah, it will put some DVDs there. Her mum and dad have decided to go ahead with the transplant with full knowledge of the risks involved. I feel quite obviously quite apprehensive and worried about it. Didn't really sleep last night, sort of for worrying. But we just want her well now, so we know that this is the journey that we need to go through to get her better. It's very difficult for families to take their well child and bring them into hospital knowing that there is a possibility that they won't take their child home again because of the risks of the process. Take every day as it comes. I'm coming to hospital to get better. That's right. <laughs> so you've got to keep remembering. The hospital could be home to Emily and her parents for months and is where they'll be spending Christmas. Tell me when you're ready. Go on, let's try that. Ta -da. This is going to be my Christmas corner. It's a very special tree and I like it very much. Today, Emily will begin an intensive regime of chemotherapy. The drugs will destroy what is left of her bone marrow and prepare her body to receive new donor cells via a blood transfusion in 10 days' time. Without the chemotherapy, if we just put the bone marrow in, it would be rejected by her immune system. So we have to take out her immune system first and at the end of that time put in the, um, the new bone marrow. Emily was a bit worried about it, so we talked about it. I explained to Emily the different drugs. They um, help clean Emily's bone marrow and make it a nice, nice home for the new bone marrow when it goes in. And what noise does a new bone marrow make then, Emily, when it goes in? Yippee! <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just going to put the chemo up. It runs over half an hour. Can we check your name, band? I'm definitely Emily Fish. Oh, are you? <laughs> and I'm definitely having a transplant. <laughs> the chemotherapy drugs will be given to Emily in stages via a drip. It's the first of about six or seven days and then tomorrow there'll be another one introduced alongside this one. It will be a gruelling process with some unpleasant side effects like sickness, high temperature and hair loss. How her body responds is critical. Do you feel any different? No, I don't feel sick. Oh, and I feel just fine. <laughs> Dr Wynn is happy with her progress so far. But tomorrow's drugs could be a completely different story. Good today. I mean, we would expect Flodabin to be good and well tolerated, and that's good. Well done. 
Tomorrow is a bit more in, a bit more intensive. We we'll use Campath tomorrow, yeah. and so what we will reliably see with Campath is a fever, yeah. and she may be a bit ropey for a few hours. I'm nervous about tomorrow. I think with the the Campath when she has that, because I think that's going to have some more stronger side effects. Really, I think we just have to take each day as it comes. It's chemotherapy is a really scary thing to, uh, for any child to be going through but we've just got to be here for her and support her. Staff at Royal Manchester Children's Hospital's A&E department treat over a hundred head injuries every month. Their latest patient is two-year-old Joseph, who's had a bit of a fall. The day when he was at nursery, um, he tripped and fell into the, the, the fireplace, I think it was, so I wasn't actually there myself to, okay. to witness it. To assess the damage, Colette Thompson from the plastic surgery team needs to take a closer look. It's, still... oh, it's, right. it's gone right down to his muscles, so it is quite deep. It needs to get a good clean to avoid any infection, obviously it needs yeah. repairing as well. Yeah. Um, so really what, what we're talking about is giving him a general anaesthetic, um, so he's asleep while we do. But the prospect of an operation is a real worry for Joseph's mum, Caroline. Obviously I'm really concerned about how he's going to be under the, trying to give him the anaesthetic because he's going to get so upset. So I just want it done as soon as possible. Joseph's taken to theatre where he's in the safe hands of anaesthetist Dr Krishna. He's been giving children general anaesthetics for over 10 years and knows how traumatic it can be for them and their parents. You can actually hold it to his face so it doesn't scare him as much. Yeah. And as he begins to go off to sleep, I'll take over. Yeah, it's okay. all right. That's it's it's a nice strawberry mask. Mm. Oh, that's nice. Mm. Come on. But even a strawberry flavored mask won't fool Joseph. Was always going to be a scary prospect for him. It's tricky because we do have to manage the emotions of the child, of the parent. Mummy's He's got, fine. Yeah. He's fine. Yeah. Mummy's got, yeah. It's uh, not as simple as putting an adult to sleep. Give him a big kiss, Mum. Yeah. Wow, big kiss. Oh, very traumatic. I knew he was going to fight it, I knew he was going to be upset, but you, you can't prepare yourself for it, really. Um, you just feel like you're betraying them, really, because being two, he just doesn't understand. It's an awful thing you have to do, but you have to do it. Now Joseph is anaesthetised, he can be operated on by Craig Russell, who specialised in paediatric plastic surgery for the past eight years does need sutures to keep the scarring to a minimum. And he's too small to have it done under local anaesthetic. He wouldn't sit still enough to be able to get a good enough repair. When he wakes up, he'll be essentially pain-free. The wound is cleaned, repaired and stitched. And now the 20 minute surgery is complete, Joseph can go to recovery and be reunited with his mum. Has been traumatic in itself. I just want to be with him now and we can get home basically. A great job. Okay. Who's a big brave boy? The Upstairs on the bone marrow transplant unit, six-year-old Emily Fish is using ABBA to take her mind off her intensive chemotherapy treatment. The drugs are helping prepare her body for the bone marrow transplant that she'll be having in 10 days' time. She's very happy, got a very positive outlook on, on things. It, it's rare you find Emily upset or sad, really. It's, most of the time she, she's just happy. For giving it to me. That's nice, has that cheered you up a bit? The chemotherapy drugs are gradually destroying Emily's immune system to make way for new donor blood cells. Today is a critical stage in her treatment. Okay, more and more Christmas every day. Quite nervous about this drug because um, it's going to be given over four hours and towards the end of it Emily could feel quite unwell, temperature. You were a bit worried about it as well, weren't you Emily, really? I'm worried about me being sick because I've not often been sick. No. She will be ill and there will be things that families won't want to see. But this is a very serious process and despite Emily looking really well, she actually has a fatal illness. Fingers crossed we'll get through it at the end.
But if Emily's ever going to be rid of her rare blood disease, this is an essential part of the process. There we go, Emily, it's in. We'll be checking her observations every 30 minutes throughout and keeping um, a check. But right, okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Emily. Okay, enjoy your lunch. Thanks. And in a matter of hours, as expected, the drugs take their toll. <laughs> Seeing Emily go through this is harder than her parents ever expected. She's just been saying to me, Mummy, can you just make the pain go away? And it's just really, really distressing to see her like that. What she's getting is very high fever and with it, some of the things that we see with fever, shivers and headache. Nothing you can do can prepare someone completely for what, for what she's going through. And it's not a pleasant experience for, for Emily or us. You'd like it to be you, but you can't be you. We know that we've got to go through this to get her better, so we've just got to try and be strong and be strong for Emily as well. She's a brave little girl, eh? Emily's now over the worst of her chemotherapy treatment and one step closer to her potentially life-saving transplant. Everything is going according to plan at this stage and as we look forward, then uh, she's got a couple more doses of chemotherapy and then the transplant next week. Downstairs in A&E, 14-year-old Jordan thinks he's got something stuck in his foot. He caught it on a floorboard when he was walking barefoot in his bedroom and it's been hurting ever since. Yeah, I'm looking you can get it out, but it's going to be sore. Very, very, very sore. I just get scared, even when they like, pull like a little tweezer thing thinking out of thinking you what they're doing next with it. They're going to start chopping my foot off. I just get scared. Can you come help me? Not gonna die over that, Jordan. Yeah, but I don't have a half a leg. <laughs> Mine started off like that. Jordan's terrified he'll end up like his stepdad, John. Just on my big toe. Got infected and that was it. It was off within eight months. But I've got diabetes, so. If I had mine like that, it would just my life would be just dead basically. Luckily, experienced A&E doctor Alex Blythe is ready to take charge. Can't see anything dramatic on the x-ray, but it does need a clean. So my foot's not coming off? Not yet. We'll give it a good clean and we'll let you take your foot home, OK? All right. All right. It's good news there's nothing stuck in Jordan's foot, but the wound needs to be cleaned with antiseptic just to make sure it doesn't get infected. You're looking very worried. If it really does hurt, tell me and I'll stop, all right? Is that really sore? Oh, okay. Well, I'll tell you what. Did you have laughing gas when he was born? Yes, I did. Yeah. Yeah. So your mum knows all about this. We've got some gas that you can breathe. That's a really good painkiller. And hopefully it'll stop your foot from hurting so I can give it a good clean, all right? Right, Jordan. I want big, deep, slow breaths. Okay, have a practice. Go on. Is that the best you can do? Come on, big, deep one. The mixture of gas and air will act as a mild sedative and should help ease the pain. In through your mouth. There's a little bit of muck in there, nothing very specific, so I've given it a good clean. We'll send you home with some antibiotics because it's a bit red around the edges and we will see you in a few days' time and check that it's all healed up nicely, all right? I'm sure that one of the reasons why Jordan was so worried was because of his stepdad's recent problems. I'm sure that with him being so young, fit and healthy, the foot wouldn't have been a major problem, but I'm very glad I cleaned it out so it didn't develop into anything more serious. Over in the bone marrow transplant unit, the day Emily and her parents have been waiting for has finally arrived. Today, I'm gonna have a bone marrow transplant. I want to get better and be very well again. I can't believe it's here, really, the day of the transplant. I just feel quite emotional about it, really. You know, it's a special day for it. The long journey but it is a journey with milestones, and today is a massive milestone. 
but finding a suitable donor for Emily has not been easy. We need a very specific match. We need literally to go through millions of people to find a donor. So we've looked through every registry in the world for Emily and found this one donor. The cells have been donated anonymously and could save Emily's life. They'll be given to her by a transfusion where they'll find their way into her bone and begin making new blood. Hello, are we ready? Yeah. Consultant clinical scientist Trevor Carr has been preparing donor cells for transplant patients for over 25 years. Do you know how many stem cells are in here? Yeah. 250 million. Wow. Mm. Do you know the best way to look after them? No. Lots of smiles. <laughs> Watching Emily's life giving blood find its way into her body is a huge relief for her mum and dad. Want you better, don't we? Those stem cells are in Emily's body now and uh, finding their new happy home. It's the best Christmas present ever. But the journey for Emily is far from over. She'll be spending the next couple of weeks in isolation while her family wait to see if her transplants worked. It's like feeling in jail. I'm not really in jail, am I? Great. We'll be catching up with Emily later in the series to see how she's getting on. It's Christmas Day and six-year-old Emily and her mum and dad are spending it in an isolation room in the hospital. Come on, let's pull a cracker. You want like a, a close-up of the cracker? <laughs> Emily's had a potentially life-saving bone marrow transplant and she and her parents are waiting to see if it's worked. It's been as nice as it can be in hospital. It's been very different, though, yeah. hasn't it? It's, it's been... You must rather have spent Christmas at home. Oh, 